Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Discovery, Inc. fourth quarter and full year 2020 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants' lines are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during this session, you will need to press star and then one in your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference may be recorded. If you require any further assistance, please press star and then zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Mr. Andrew Slavin, Executive Vice President, Global Investor Strategy. Sir, you may begin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Discovery's Q4 earnings call. Joining me today are David Zaslav, President and Chief Executive Officer, Gunnar Wiedenfels, Chief Financial Officer, and J.B. Perrett, President and CEO, Discovery Networks International. You should have received your earnings release, but if not, feel free to access it on our website at www.corporate.discovery.com. On today's call, we will begin with some opening comments from David and Gunnar, and then we will open the call to take questions. Before we start, I'd like to remind you that comments today regarding the company's future business plans, prospects, and financial performance are forward-looking statements that we make pursuant to the safe harbor provisions of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These statements are made based on management's current knowledge and assumptions about future events, and they involve risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially from our expectations. In providing projections and other forward-looking statements, the company disclaims any intent or obligation to update them. For additional information on important factors that could affect these expectations, please see our Form 10-K and our subsequent filings made with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. And with that, I'd like to turn the call over to David. Good morning, and I hope everyone is having a great start to 2021. And we thank you all for joining us here today. This is a dynamic time for discovery. The past year has been one of change, challenge, and opportunity, during which we've shown incredible resilience, creativity, and focus as one global team. From navigating the pandemic to generating meaningful momentum towards our strategic pivot, Discovery has responded with drive and determination. This is also a unique time for us. Because as we are working hard to solidify our core linear business, in which we continue to meaningfully outperform, we are repositioning the company against a massive new opportunity in streaming, where we already see very positive signals and signs that taken together with the durability of our core business, will nicely position the company for sustainable long-term growth sustainable long-term growth. That is our mission, and we are laser-focused on delivering. We finished 2020 with strong operating momentum and great command and control across our global businesses, delivering top-line improvements across virtually every key operating metric since the pandemic hit, while maintaining strong discipline over our expenses without sacrificing quality or missing a beat in our creative execution. We were even able to return nearly $1 billion of capital to shareholders in equity buybacks. We learned a lot as we managed through 2020, and our tenacity and agility, which is truly at the heart of discovery, took center stage. The impact of our content either as measured in terms of global share growth or simply in the way people sought us out for comfort and nourishment during a difficult time, became more relevant and more of the moment like never before. We encouraged our talent to bring us into their kitchens, gardens, living rooms, with iPhones and GoPros, and it was a game changer. When most of our peers showed older repeats, we became closer to real and more authentic on air. And that provided a great boost of adrenaline across the company and our talent partners and refined our IP all around the globe. And I'm even more excited about 2021 and the meaningful progress we are making in our strategic pivot. 
while at the same time working hard to support our core linear networks business and reinforcing its importance as a critical part of our total consumer offering. Discovery Plus is off to a fantastic start. And we couldn't be more encouraged by all the early metrics. After seven weeks since launching here in the US, we have over 11 million paying direct to consumer subscribers across our entire portfolio. And we will hit 12 million by the end of this month of February. An increase of 7 million net ads as compared to 5 million subs we reported in December. The vast majority of this increase is attributable to Discovery Plus. And substantially more than half of the 7 million ads are paying Discovery Plus subscribers in the United States. And we are really just getting started internationally, as this comes without adding any new markets other than our previous deep play markets that we rebranded to Discovery Plus. For example, we relaunched Italy just a few weeks ago and the UK in Q4 2020, both of which are off to a strong start. Given our ownership and control of all of our content, our increasingly relevant content, expect us to light up markets globally over the next 18 months or so. And in many key markets, we intend to partner with key distributors, such as we did with Vodafone and Sky. These discussions are active and going very well. And our existing momentum is helping facilitate these conversations as distributors remain keen to provide incremental value to their subscribers as a means of leveraging their pipe and decommoditizing their offering. In both regards, we are a fantastic partner. We bring strong global and local IP at really superior value. We are by far the best value to consumers and distributors in a global SVOD service in the marketplace helped by our financial model and the fact that we own all of our global IP. The rollout of the Discovery Plus platform has been nearly flawless without any technological disruptions or outages. The Discovery Plus product launched with all major platforms and devices, Roku, Fire, Android, Apple, Samsung, and there's more to come. And we came to market with an ambitious slate of over a thousand original hours over the coming year. Stay tuned for further delivery partnerships, such as partnerships with cable operators and other connected TV platforms, all of which move us further along as our goal to be among the most widely available platforms to consumers everywhere on the globe, with easy access to consumers in every language. Importantly, consumers love the Discovery Plus product, and it shows with all key operating metrics pointing in the right direction. We're seeing very high consumer engagement and high video starts. An incredible 93% of our entire 55,000 episode library has been watched, indicating a very healthy long tail of content that has immense value to consumers now that we've made it available. We're also seeing high retention over the first 60 days, as well as strong monetization that is already translating into incremental value. Gunnar will provide some additional details and financial context, but in short, stronger operating performance across the board is contributing to a better than expected financial profile and accelerating next-gen revenue growth in Q1 and thereafter. Very healthy role to pay and initial signs of lower churn than we initially modeled will drive accelerating sequential domestic affiliate fee growth, even over Q4's impressive 5% growth rate as we begin to layer Discovery Plus on top of our core base 
resulting in at least high single, if not double digit affiliate growth in the following quarter. We now have over 100 advertisers and brands on the platform in the US, and we expect to double that by the end of Q2. Our team is working hard at implementing our feature-rich product roadmap. We are now offering contextual keyword targeting and interactive ads will roll out by the end of Q1 with pause and binge ads scheduled for Q2. And as the subscriber base further scales, the benefits of combining the intelligence and data mining capabilities on our end, together with advertiser first party data, will represent a significant opportunity for us and our advertising partners. We are already an industry leader when it comes to time spent with our linear portfolio. Yet watch time on Discovery Plus in the US is nearly twice that. This naturally has been extremely well received by our advertising and brand partners, which coupled with initial signs that Discovery Plus extends effective reach to non-pay TV viewers gives us even more conviction and confidence in the long-term ARPU trajectory. In fact, our ad light ARPU in the U.S. is already above linear, and we are just getting started. As we scale and usage continues, we are confident our ARPU will grow meaningfully. Internationally, JB and our product and engineering teams are hard at work transitioning our former D-Play and Eurosport player platforms to our new Discovery Plus global product in time for the Tokyo Olympics and the Beijing Games not long thereafter. Discovery Plus will be the streaming home of the games in Europe with access to every minute, every medal, and every hero, live and on demand. Having this product integration completed will enable us to then execute more of our ambitious international expansion plan in the back half of the year, as I previously noted. Taken together, Discovery Plus has successfully launched as a truly differentiated product with a fantastic consumer experience, best-in-class product reviews, and terrific word of mouth, which is ultimately the most effective form of marketing. We are being educated every day on what's working and what's not, and are responding rapidly to iterate and experiment. We are utilizing all of our levers to effectively and efficiently acquire and retain subscribers, including a growing list of global partnerships with many of the world's leading distributors, an exciting pipeline of originals that we believe will surprise and delight consumers, and a brand campaign that is unrivaled in our history. The team is doing a lot right and we are seeing the payoff in subscriber additions and engagement, for which we believe there is no better use of our capital and resources than to continue to support these efforts as a means to drive shareholder value. With the very healthy metrics we've seen thus far, scaling our Discovery Plus subscriber base as quickly as possible is the best use of our free cash flow as we eye sustainable long-term financial growth for the overall discovery company. Our first and foremost priority has always been, and will always be, to reinvest in our business to drive organic growth. Our powerful launch serves as a strong confirmation of what we have been hard at work building over the last many years, and that which the acquisition of scripts helped to accelerate. We have spent years amassing and cultivating the most popular real-life entertainment content, brands, and personalities, all with a focus on nurturing and delighting our fans across multiple video ecosystems, pay, free, and streaming. It's having a real impact, and an impact we expect will continue to grow. Investing in high-quality premium programming across the entirety of our platforms has always been our North Star. In fact, at a time when many of our peers are taking their foot off the gas, we expect to increase our spend on fresh content to support our linear networks this year. This further reinforces our strong value proposition to our distribution partners. Indeed, we believe the basic 
pay TV bundle is integral and relevant and offers an incredible value proposition to an important and large segment of consumers. Discovery is a true global IP company in every sense of the word, one of the very few true global IP companies. And growing our vault of great stories and series has laid the groundwork for the critical next steps we are taking. Evolving from a pay TV and free to air company into a scaling global streaming player. Discovery's mission is to play hard in traditional free to air and cable with fantastic margins and free cash flow and play harder in direct to consumer while we are uniquely positioned to achieve long-term sustainable growth. With that, let me now turn it over to Gunnar. Thank you, David, and good morning, everyone. Echoing David's comments, 2020 was indeed a year that presented its fair share of challenges. Likewise, it stress-tested our company in unprecedented ways. Looking back, I am extraordinarily proud of both how our team reacted to such disruption, as well as how we proactively leaned forward into our strategic pivot. I do believe we accomplished a tremendous amount in 2020, operationally, financially, managerially, and strategically. And it set us up for a great start to 2021 and beyond, which I will discuss in more detail shortly. But first, to briefly recap Q4, a very solid set of results across the board. Starting with U.S. networks, advertising revenues were consistent with the prior year, supported by an ad market that continued to show signs of recovery, as well as a general tightening of the marketplace due to political spend. Following a generally advantageous upfront market, we saw extremely healthy scatter CPMs up in the high 20% range versus upfront, and up high single digits year over year. And that trend has continued into the first quarter with scatter CPMs up around 40% versus upfront and up mid-teens year over year. While on balance, demand has returned in most categories to year-ago levels, a number of verticals such as travel, movie studios, and restaurant chains still remain challenged. U.S. distribution revenues increased a very solid 5% year-over-year during the fourth quarter, as pricing more than offset subscriber declines, supporting a nice acceleration from Q3. We benefited from a combination of a slower pace of subscriber declines, the impact from recent renewals, and our continued strength across virtual MVPDs. Subscribers to our core fully distributed networks declined by 3%, while our total portfolio subscribers declined by 5%. Now turning to the international networks for the fourth quarter, which I will discuss on a constant currency basis. Advertising revenues decreased 1% year over year, led primarily by continuing sequential improvements across many of our key markets. And some, like the UK, Germany, Poland, and certain APAC countries finished the fourth quarter with positive growth, while other markets, such as across Latin America, are still exhibiting COVID-related weakness. Distribution revenues decreased 4% year over year. We continue to see modest subscriber churn from more economically challenged countries in Latin America. Furthermore, COVID-related disruption in the sports schedule throughout 2020 continued to impact our Eurosport performance in the fourth quarter, as well as continued headwinds in overall pricing, primarily in EMEA. Total operating expenses were up 5% during the quarter. Cost of revenues were up 6%, largely due to the condensing of the sports schedule into the back half of the year and continued ramp and content investments to support our next generation initiatives. SGNA increased 3% as we invested in marketing and branding promotion ahead of the launch of Discovery Plus, as well as personnel and technology spending to support our initiatives. And as we guided, we finished 2020 with total operating expenses flat year over year XFX as we reallocated spend and we continue to target a low to mid single digit percentage reduction in our core linear businesses as we support our next gen endeavors. Turning to free cash flow, we finished 2020 with over $2.3 billion in free cash flow, a 56% AOBITDA to free cash flow conversion rate. A great finish considering the volatility and headwinds we faced this past year and still do to an extent from disruptions related to COVID, while at the same time having absorbed a meaningful step up in D2C investments. And as we guided to at our December investor day, we continue to expect to convert at least 50% of our AOBITDA to free cash flow this year. Now turning to Discovery Plus, which is off to a very impressive start. 
And though it's early in our launch and global rollout, we are very pleased with all of the early metrics. First, we have now surpassed 11 million total global paying direct to consumer subscribers after less than 60 days since the launch in the US, the majority of which are attributed to Discovery Plus and more than half of the subscriber additions were in the US. And as David mentioned, we will hit 12 million global paying subscribers by the end of the month. Second, importantly, both roll to pay and churn have been better than planned. And while early, these represent critical variables in our modeling. Third, engagement as measured by average watch time per active viewer has been robust and already significantly ahead of linear. Fourth, this engagement along with advertisers and brands eager to embrace our subscriber base is driving higher CPMs. It is worth pointing out the value our advertisers see in the portion of our subscriber base that are not currently pay TV subscribers, delivering much needed incremental reach to the video advertising ecosystem. This as well has contributed to very healthy ad monetization that is already well ahead of plan. Number five, this has led to ARPU for our ad light product that has already surpassed average linear ARPU. And we see further upside as we drive scale and subscribers, a key tenant we laid out for you in early December. Number six, early signs of churn are within our expectations, if not better, which taken together with the monetization framework I provided are contributing to a higher implied customer lifetime value than our initial modeling. Number seven, finally, subscriber acquisition costs have so far come in very favorably, especially compared with the evolving customer lifetime value. Consequently, taking these early data points together, we see both a very strong start to next-gen revenue growth in 2021, with Q1 poised to grow around 50% with meaningful acceleration in the quarters thereafter, and a much more attractive investment opportunity around subscriber growth. Given Discovery Plus net ads, the majority of which are in the US, we should also enjoy a more direct tailwind to our domestic distribution growth profile this quarter. As such, we expect Q1 domestic distribution revenue to increase at least high single digits, if not low double digits year over year, a meaningful acceleration from the last quarters. I must say, I like the sound of that. Candidly, it's been a while since we have had a growth profile like that for domestic distribution. While the advertisers embrace for Discovery Plus has been great and will help to support our overall advertising profile as we scale, we expect a modest sequential headwind to Q1 US advertising revenues, in part related to macro factors, as well as the launch of Discovery Plus, where we are leaning in with more of our inventory to promote the service. We have embarked on an aggressive branding and performance marketing campaign, and we are seeing efficient SAC. As I noted earlier, with SAC so favorable to CLV, we expect to lean into this opportunity in a greater way, and we now expect to see greater incremental next generation losses than the 200 to 300 million dollars initially described. This could potentially be a couple hundred million more, but it's too early to pinpoint a finer range. I am very confident to categorize this as success-based spending. We do, however, still see 2021 as representing the peak year for losses from our investment initiatives. Which brings us to capital allocation, where our first priority is to reinvest in our business to drive long-term growth and shareholder value. And for the near term, the most productive use of our free cash flow will be to drive Discovery Plus subscribers. Thus, you should not expect us to be in the market buying back our equity in the near term, though as we gain additional clarity around requisite spend to support our rollout, we will of course revisit the buyback. We finished 2020 at approximately 3.3 times net leverage. Through 2021, due to timing factors around spend and the Olympic Games, our leverage may at times trend above our target range. Though we and the rating agencies are comfortable with this outlook, particularly as we remain committed to our investment grade rating. Now, turning to a couple of housekeeping items to help you with forecasting 2021. We expect our effective book tax rate to remain in the low 20% range, while our cash tax rate, excluding PPA, will be in the mid 20% range. And finally, we are budgeting FX to have a positive $170 million year-over-year -year impact on revenues and a neutral year-over-year -year impact on AOBITDA. In closing, we are incredibly excited by the initial success of Discovery Plus and remain as enthusiastic as ever as we position the company for long-term sustained growth. Clearly, lots more to accomplish given only a few months in, and we look forward to updating you on our progress. Thank you again for joining us. With that, I'd like to turn it over to the operator for the Q&A portion of the call, and David, JB, and I will be happy to take your questions. 
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, please press star and then one on your touchtone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, please press the pound key. Once again, to ask a question, please press star and then one at this time. And our first question comes from Robert Fishman from Moffitt Nathanson. Your line is open. Hi, good morning. Um, can you be a little bit more specific about the cadence of the international rollout for Discovery Plus in the next few months? And have your partners like Vodafone really started to ramp up on the marketing to their sub base yet? And then, while clearly still early, anything you can help share on the international monetization of the subscriber base and if you're seeing higher ARPU levels there relative to your linear subscriber base? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Robert. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're really just getting started. We've built a robust platform, but in order to roll it out globally, it needs to be modified. It needs to be modified to be, to be embedded with Vodafone, to be embedded with Telecom Italia, each of the different distributors. Um, we're working on getting it, it embedded with, with a number of the cable players domestically and around the world. We have rebranded D-Play. Uh, Discovery Plus. As you know, our strategy outside the U.S., which we think is really unique, is local entertainment, local nonfiction, local sport in Europe, and local entertainment, local nonfiction around the world. And that library from the last 25 to 30 years of local content really differentiates us from Netflix and, and Disney and makes us you know, a great companion if you're putting together a bundle. So um, we are seeing uh, some real growth in the few markets that we've launched in. We're using the Olympics as a forcing mechanism where we're looking to rebuild the platform uh, so that coming out of the uh, we're ready with the Olympics all across Europe. And then coming out of that, we'll be able to roll out. But, uh, you know, for instance, Vodafone w will not be for a little while. But, JB, why don't you give some more specifics? Yeah. So, uh, Robert, as, as David mentioned, we are obviously – undergoing a significant amount of work to replatform it. Basically what that means is our, our front end product uh, that was the former D-Play product in Europe was built on a different front end uh, platform than our U.S. product. And so as we do two things, one is migrate the U.S. product to be our global product. We have some important kind of infrastructure work to get done here in advance of the Olympics. And number two, as we talked about in back in December, we will be collapsing our Eurosport player product into Discovery Plus. And so we need to also do some work to in incorporate that product into Discovery Plus. Both of those things are the, you know, our primary focus and taking up a fair amount of our uh, engineering and, and product bandwidth uh, over the course of the next four or five months pre-Olympics. So that's going to be the primary focus and getting that right uh, in the first half of this year. As we come out of the Olympics and go into the second half of the year, that's when you're going to see the acceleration of the international rollouts. And so that's the time frame I think about. Um, the uh, uh, and, and using Vodafone specifically, since you mentioned it, uh, really that will be a back half of 21 uh, and even bleeding uh, several markets into 22 uh, as well as we launch with them. Uh, and then the third thing in terms of ARPU, the only thing I'd say there is, um, you know, what we do know and what we've seen so far is uh, these retail partnerships with the Vodafone uh, and others, as well as our direct-to-consumer, um, the, the premium and the multiples over our wholesale model in, internationally are still easily 3 to 4x the pricing that we see in our existing wholesale models. So we see a lot of pricing advantage uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Discovery Plus uh, model and the partnerships we have versus our existing business. Great. Thank you both. Thank you. Our next question comes from Stephen Cajal from Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks. Um, maybe first just wondering if you could update us on what sort of ARPU trends you're seeing on Discovery Plus, how those are performing versus your expectation, and maybe how those split between U.S. and international and subscription versus advertising. And then, David, I was wondering if you could give us an update on Magnolia in terms of timing. And you mentioned the Olympics and the golf season, but are there any other big content events that we should be mindful of during the year that might uh, drive uh, subscriber acquisition on Discovery Plus? Thanks. Sure. Uh, why don't I start? I'll start with Magnolia. 
Uh, Chip and Joe have been uh, huge supporters of Discovery Plus, and for the audience around the world, and particularly here in the U.S., the delight with the fact that Fixer Upper is back, uh, Magnolia Table uh, with, uh, with, with Joe, um, really strong, and the, all exclusive to Discovery Plus, as well as, as the slate that we've been developing, and they as chief creative officers have, have been creating, is on Discovery Plus. The good news is there's a huge amount of incremental content coming from them, as well as all the content that we were uh, putting on Magnolia. All of that will continue to be on Discovery Plus. Uh, we've, we've come up with a really creative uh, partnership because Magnolia itself is a huge business for them and uh, a transactional business. And so w we will be launching an app together where people can go uh, and take all kinds of classes. Uh, they, could, uh, they, could, they can do workshops. They can transact business with the Magnolia product. They can transact business with, with a number of things that Chip and Joe will be curating. Um, but all the content that's developed will be on Discovery Plus. So effectively, when it launches, whatever number of subs that we have will be subs that will have the Magnolia app available to it. So it's, it's really a win-win. It becomes effectively part of us, and uh, they, we become part of them. They become part of us, and it's uh, one and one equals two. Okay. Um, uh, Stephen, let, let me take the, uh, the, the question on ARPU. So a couple of points, uh, you know, of what we're seeing so far, and remember it's early days, but uh, starting with the U.S., I think the most important point uh, that I've looked at is, is our ability to monetize the advertising side for the, um, for the uh, ad light subscribers. And I'm super pleased with what we're seeing there. You know, we had this, uh, uh, this bogey of you know, getting three times the CPM uh, compared to linear. We're, we're, we're uh, on, a, on, a, on a very good track here. We're already making more on a per sub basis uh, uh, altogether with these uh, uh, ad light subscribers compared to the linear ecosystem. So that's, that's great. You know, uh, obviously, the price points for, uh, for the ad-free product. And I should say that uh, the subscriber base is queuing a little more towards ad-free, given the relative attractiveness of the, of, of the price point here, I think. But uh, so for the U.S. side, uh, so far, uh, ahead of expectations. Internationally, as, as JB said, the, the most important point is uh, we're expecting a multiple uh, uh, delta between what we're achieving here on the direct-to-consumer side compared with linear. But I also want to say, it's early days, and especially on the international side, driven by such deal cadence, et cetera, that number could move around a little. That's why you're not going to hear us talk a lot about ARPU specifically. I would like you guys to focus on the next generation revenue. That's why we you know, gave the growth guidance there. And it's, it's, uh, it's a very compelling story, I think. We, we grew 18% in 2020. Fourth quarter was up 26% for next generation revenue. Uh, we're now looking at f roughly 50% for the first quarter, and I expect that number, that growth, uh, to further accelerate uh, as we go through the year. So uh, uh, top to bottom, I think, uh, very, very encouraging for first results here. The, the one other thing, Gunnar, if you might, if I, that I might add just on for the international is that, you know, based on the success we've seen in, in the last 45 days on the U.S. ad light product, that's really not a product that we've rolled out anywhere internationally. And, and we see an opportunity there to take that same model uh, with the same higher ARPU uh, and take it around the world. And so as we part of the replatforming we talked about just a minute ago is going to enable us to offer an ad light and an ad free product as we take Discovery Plus around the world. And I think in a number of markets, particularly in Europe, with our big advertising footprint there, that we think there's going to be additional opportunity for higher ARPU growth uh, with both uh, both products and both tiers in market at the same time. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Doug Mitchelson from Credit Suisse. Your line is open. Well, thanks so much, and uh, congratulations to uh, David and the team on the uh, successful launch. A um, couple of questions for, for, for Gunnar and a couple for David. Um, Gunnar, one of the things that seemed pretty conservative at the analyst day was your target margin of 20% for streaming. Uh, is it fair to say you know you're you're pacing well beyond that given some of the metrics you laid out and and if you threw all this into a blender, what kind of margins would you get on sort of a terminal basis for streaming? And a clarification, Gunnar, you said CPMs were up 40% uh, over the upfront 1Q. You said up mid-teens year over year. Um, not to be sort of 
too too in the weeds, but is that sort of booked to date, or is that your anticipation of how the quarter is tracking, including you know the March period last year where it where it fell off? And um, for David, you know, when, when you think about the usage of the research you've done so far, I know it's early days. How do you feel about the idea? Is this is this super fans coming in and, and racing to try your streaming service? Is this just you know a mix of subscribers that you think is you know, sustainable and normal and, and not overly driven by super fans. Sort of what's your an- anticipation there? And then lastly, David, if you wouldn't mind, on, on content and investment, it seems like, um, at least our track, and you'll tell me how far off we are, it seems like shows representing about 9% of your linear viewing is seeing their originals debut on streaming. Is that sort of the right mix? Are you thinking of ramping that more aggressively, or is the originals that you have coming means, you know, means that the, 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 the linear is going to sort of stay with the content level that it has right now. Anyways, uh, thanks for all that. Sure. Uh, uh, thanks, Doug. Um, you know, right now it seems quite broad. We're getting subscribers from our broad marketing. We're seeing subscribers coming in from from our own marketing on our own platforms. We're seeing a lot of digital. Uh, the age is is really across the board. A lot of that has to do, I think, with the great work that Disney has done in acclimating people. Um, the encouraging thing is that we, we see good numbers about people once they know about the product, wanting to have the product. Um, and, you know, and we're, one of the reasons that we're marketing is we think we've got a great product and we need more people to understand what it is. Um, you know, for 60 days in, with a product called Discovery Plus, We've had to do a lot of work. It's a great brand that people love, but we had to explain that it's home, food, Chip and Joe, crime, you know, uh, Oprah Winfrey. It's and there's all of this, all the stuff that uh, uh, the people that, that people like. So that was number one. The role to pay has been terrific. The the amount of time people have been spending on is terrific. And so right now uh, it looks good. We can't tell you how big the market is, but right now it feels like. We're off and running. Um, uh, in, in terms of the, the content that we're moving around, we're really experimenting. Um, and the interesting thing is the way our product works so far is it's very different than Disney or Netflix. Um, we have this massive library. And when we say what's trending, if you took all the top shows that are trending and put them all together, it represents less than 10% of what people are watching. And so it's, it, 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 we have such a diversity of content. When you talk about you know, scripted series and scripted movies where you have eight people playing that game, they're going there for a scripted series and they tend, or they're going there for, for a movie. For us, since, we, since we've pulled together that other 50%, they're, they're watching Discovery stuff. They're going in and watching Prince William and the environmental documentary. And, and you know, other people are going in there and, and watching the fact that we have the largest crime library or paranormal or, or food fans. So uh, we're just experimenting. We're moving some. We're moving things around, but we still have a full commitment to the existing bundle. We are the bundle. I mean, it's basically news, sports, and us. And a lot of the other players are now in. You know, they're in repeat mode. And for us, we have a real equitable argument. Uh, you know, I was talking. Um, you know, with uh, uh, with with some of our operators over the weekend. You know, about the amount of original content that we're still doing and the amount of you know, the amount of viewership that we're getting um, on the platform. And so we think we could do both. And we're experimenting, moving things between the two. All right. Uh, Doug, and on, on your other uh, two financial questions here, uh, the, the margin, look, I mean, I, I gave that, uh, you know, at least 20% number because I was very, very confident that we'd be able to hit it. If if you look at what we've learned since then, every metric has come in better. Um, so I think it's safe to say that that's even more conservative from today's perspective. At the same time, there may be some sort of pulling, uh, you know, impact forward or so. So I'm not in a position to, to, to give a new estimate now. We're focused on, you know, building this product out and, and, and optimizing uh, uh, this now. But uh, I feel very, very good about the margin potential in the long run. Um, and then uh, on, the, on the CPM side, just to clarify that the 40% are based on what we're seeing in our bookings. Um, I think that was, uh, was your other question, right? Yeah, uh, the, but also the, the mid-teens year over year, is, is that like tracing, pacing against the full 1Q of last year or just uh, you know bookings to date for the quarter? 
that's that's based on the on what's on the books right now for the same uh, for the same uh, period of last year. But but as I said, I mean we we do uh, as I said a couple of minutes ago, we do expect a modest headwind because we're using some of our inventory for uh, our own promotion. Still have uh, somewhat limited visibility, et cetera. Right? Keep that in mind as well, please. Thank you both. Thank you. Our next question comes from Cut John Moral from RBC Capital Markets. Your line is open. Great. Thank you for taking the questions. Um, first, you're clearly more bullish on DTC today than you were maybe just a few months ago. Um, you're ramping investments even more. Early subscriber KPIs sound very attractive, whether it's CPMs or churn. I guess I'll give it another shot and ask if you'd be willing to provide any thoughts on what DTC subscriber levels you expect to achieve, whether it's U.S. or international or 2021 or even looking out further, just any framework would be helpful. And then secondly, how do we think about the Go apps and what that business looks like going forward as you ramp and pivot even more into Discovery Plus? Thanks. Um, well, let me talk about Go, which is really, you know, our AVOD, where we're getting, you know, terrific CPMs. Um, it's been a great feeder a really terrific, terrific feeder for us, uh, which is really an efficient conversion. Um, uh, and, you know, it's really, we have a holistic view here. Uh, we have our traditional business with great margins where we continue to, which, which we think you know, outside the U.S., it's, it's, it, it, it's declining, but at a, at a much slower rate than in, in the U.S. But in the U.S., we, we're seeing some stability. We expect that it'll decline. But we really like our, our position there. Then we have uh, the Go AVOD, uh, where we have a very young demo and a very good economics. Um, and people continue to go there. And the more people we can get to go there, the more people can come over that want to get our SVOD service, which has a lot more stuff. Um, so we think it's a really like a great one, two, three combo. And for advertisers, it's terrific. Um, so we're going to continue to look at the, at the market. And as JB said, we're evolving. You know, we have a very low priced product given the marketplace. It's an unbelievable value. If you look at the value of us at four ninety nine and add light versus everyone else with the library we have and the originals, it's terrific. Outside the U.S., we can go a lot cheaper than that and still have a multiple of the ARPU that we uh, that we get. But as JB said, we're learning. You know, we've been at this for five years. That's how I think we, we took so much time to launch to figure out how do we get everything aligned. But the idea of AVOD, SVOD, add light, and some now we're going to add uh, SVOD with, uh, uh, with, with, with low commercials. But we'll also, in some markets, we might want to put in a big front porch of AVOD. And we've been doing that in a couple of markets already and finding that that's a, a real feeder. And, you know, the fact that we have advertisers in go gave, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons we have 100 advertisers in Discovery Plus right now. So who knows where all this will be in five years. But right now, you know, we have great ARPU on our existing business domestically and around the world. We're getting started. We're way ahead of where we were. And we like the metrics, and we're going to – we'll just follow the consumer need. I don't know, JB, just to, maybe a little on AVOD from your perspective. Yeah, I think, I think the interesting thing, back to David's experimentation point, uh, is that we have, we have done some things even in the course of the last 60 days where we uh, initially um, – you know, took down some content that was originally on Go and then put it back up. And I guess the point would be generally, to David's point of, these are just incredibly uh, uh, additive customer segments. You know, I think we look at each of these as being very additive customer segments. And the Go performance so far, even in the course of Discovery Plus, um, has continued to see the same high level of engagement as we had pre-Discovery Plus launch as we have post-Discovery Plus launch. And so, from a uh, from an engagement perspective, all indications are, which was again a little bit of our thesis back in December, which we obviously you know didn't know 100%, but that this could be not an either or, but an and, and that so far it is looking a lot more like an and, uh, even that we might have expected back in December. And on Go, uh, we're still very pleased with the engagement and the level of uh, uh, of usage that that platform is getting. And we have some new product innovations that we're going to be rolling out over the course of the next couple months that we think will continue to make that product ever more compelling. And so we feel comfortable with that, that business continuing to be a, a good growth, a healthy growth driver for us going forward. 
And then maybe just just to uh, uh, close out that last question, we're, we're we're still not in the position to give a uh, you know long term or short term subscriber guidance here. We're super uh, super happy with what we're seeing. Uh, again, you know, top to bottom, ahead of uh, expectations. Uh, we we have a lot of distribution still coming down the pike. Uh, we, we're really just getting started internationally, uh, so that's that's on the positive side. Um, we'll, we'll see. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of value of us sort of you know discussing uh, scenarios here. Understood. Thank you all. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ben Swinburne from Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Good morning. Uh, David, I wanted to ask you about your sort of content plans as you look at linear versus streaming in the U.S. I mean, I think of Discovery, you've been probably uh, the most deliberate, I think, in balancing what you deliver to your MVPD partners with what you're now building in streaming, as, you, as I'm sure you'd agree. Others have gone much further sort of creating competitive products. Given the success so far in the U.S., I know it's early, but also you hinted at a cable partnership in your prepared remarks. Are you feeling more kind of optimistic or comfortable, you know, putting your best IP on D2C versus linear in terms of exclusive or other things? Just, just give us a, a sense of your mindset to sitting here today. And then, Gunnar, um, you gave some advertising commentary for Q1. I'm just wondering if you could talk about the, the shape of the year. Obviously, the comps get pretty easy in Q2, Q3. And then would you be willing to give us what the next-gen revenues were in dollars uh, last year? Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ben. Um, you know, one of the great things is we get to see what people, wa what people watch and how they watch it and what they like. And I would say – I wouldn't say best. I would say different. We're continuing to invest in our traditional uh, channels around the world. And that's building our, IP, our global IP library. Um, and so we'll continue to do that. It's still a great model. Um, and we think it's going to go on for quite some time. It's also a terrific feeder. So the people that are watching our cable channels are buying the product. People that are going to go and seeing some of the product that they've downloaded and they like, they're buying the product. You know, so um, we think it's it really advantageous to us to, to keep that nourished. And um, it's good for us with our existing distributors because they appreciate that and that we're key, that we're key to the bundle and, and we're, we're supporting it. Having said that, there, there are a number of things that we're learning. Like if we do a, a big crime documentary, a big crime documentary, we could put it on ID and, and we have put it on ID. But they, you know, some of those things are they want to watch it when they want to watch it. When we did the Prince William documentary on the environment, on Discovery, I think it would have done well. It did unbelievably well in, hmm. in on Discovery Plus. You know, everybody wanted to see it. Um, same thing with Attenborough. I think a lot of the stuff that we have, um, it, some of it is different, um, but we are starting to get some clues on the kind of things that people like to have on a platform and watch whenever they want. <clears throat> whenever they want. We also have seen that we're getting a lot of comments that, that this is a service that people could could watch sort of in two ways. One is, you know, while they're while they're cooking, they can you know, we added a a, a feature where you can uh, almost like a synthetic channel where if you love Fixer Upper and you love the Property Brothers and you love Guy Fieri, you can just put that into the put that into the app. And that's what will that's what will run all day long. And so on the one hand, you may really want to watch the Attenborough or this great crime documentary or, or Ina Garten is doing a great show with Melissa McCarthy. Um, uh, but you also may want to just put it on so you, wa you have something really fun that you love to watch while you're cooking or while you're homeschooling the kids or while you're working. And a lot of the SVOD products are, have, are there for intention, what is, where you have a full-on focused intent to view, which we have. And we have great content, great characters, great brands. But we also have this ability to be a companion. Uh, the content is on, and it's a great companion for you when you're home, or it's a great companion. We have your favorite shows. So it's a balance. And we're looking – we think we could do both. Fantastic differentiated content uh, that people love, and also the content and characters that they love that they can hang around with all day. Remember, food and HG and ID – uh, together with Fox News, are the four, you know, longest length of view cable networks in America, with our three being women and Fox News being men. And there's a reason for that behaviorally. People sometimes want to have that 
on, you know, during the day, and they can do that with our app. And so we think both of those provide a value equation. Um, and then, Ben, in terms of advertising, uh, uh, I mean, visibility is still limited. I'm not in a position to you know, come up with a, with, a, with a full year outlook here. But obviously, you're right that, that the comms should uh, start looking a little better uh, from, from Q2 on. We've seen this sequential improvement. And as I said earlier, some of the international markets have actually already been, uh, have already been up. Uh, in, in Q4, and we, we see, uh, you know, strong momentum into Q1. It is, it is early. I mean, I, I told you about pricing. We, we, we do have a great upfront uh, deal in place. Uh, options or uh, option cancellations are looking good uh, right now. But again, um, we, we don't have a ton of visibility. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll see. But hopefully, you know, the balance is, is going to skew positively uh, starting, starting Q2 here. In terms of the um, next gen revenue, you know, just, just want to, we did, we did, we were able to make some two meaningful hires um, that are, that have really been helping us. One is we, we hired the head of sales for, uh, for Hulu, Jim Keller, yeah. Jim Keller, who's really terrific. Um, we have a great team, but how do we take ourselves to the next level? And then we just hired last week the head of the CMO yeah, from Hulu, yeah. the CMO from from Hulu to come over. And so we've brought over a lot of expertise here that we think in terms of selling our product, selling the digital product, getting someone that has years and years of experience of just doing that together with the, you know, the very strong team that we have. And Steinloff's doing a fantastic job. And then take the great marketing team that we have with all the strength and you've seen the campaign and bring someone who's been doing just subscriber acquisition for the last, you know, eight years um, is going to help this company really uh, grow. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, uh, again, next generation revenue is 800, roughly 850 million in 2020. And again, that was a growth of 18% versus 2019. Accelerating in the fourth quarter to 26%, accelerating in the first quarter now to roughly 50%, and then accelerating from there and to be quantified. But it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a great story, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from John Hodelik from UBS. Your line is open. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. Um, maybe for Gunnar, just a, a couple, some clarifications on some of the cost items. Um, you talked about uh, spending some more on, on the content spend. I think you guys have spent about $3 billion a year the last couple of years. You know, can you give us a sense of the magnitude of, of the increase there? And then on the guide, any, any chance you could sort of bucket some of the, the areas um, that, that you might, you know, spend, if, you know, leaning into D2C with that incremental, you know, up to $200 million in, in EBITDA? That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, so starting with content spend, two, two things to keep in mind for this year. One is the Olympics is going to flow through with a very significant uh, license fee, of course, in the, uh, uh, in the, in the third quarter. Um, uh, other than that, the, the content spent on a uh, consolidated basis for the entire company is uh, growing significantly. That's part of that uh, uh, guide that we have given, uh, obviously with a focus on uh, direct-to-consumer first products. But keep in mind, you know, as David said, we're experimenting with those windows uh, for our content. And I think one of our great advantages has always been our ability to use that content across territories, across platforms, uh, and th thereby further driving that efficiency. Yeah? But so that's that's one of the one of the chunks that had always been part of this uh, guidance, I think in terms of, you know, what we see additional spend right now, first and foremost, it's marketing. And again, I mean, uh, I, I said it earlier, but uh, given how uh, our engagement churn metrics and the monetization metrics are trending, uh, our customer lifetime value looks much better than what we thought it was going to be in December. And at the same time, subscriber acquisition has been incredibly efficient, um, uh, a little better than, uh, than we, what we planned for. So that gap between uh, customer lifetime value and SAC uh, is just very compelling. And, and that's, that's the largest driver uh, for us to really lean in and spend more on the marketing side uh, all the way through the funnel. Initially, a lot of top of the funnel marketing, uh, but we'll definitely keep uh, you know, firing on that performance marketing side uh, as we go through the year here. And then in addition to that, uh, you know, on the technology side as well, there, there's a lot of fast follow uh, features that are in the pipeline. Uh, the team is working hard. JB already spoke about replatforming. You know, you know, there, there's some work to do internationally uh, as well. Um, but again, all of that is going to help us accelerate the rollout here. 
that's going to help us accelerate the advertising growth. Uh, David already mentioned, you know, binge ads and pause ads and uh, interactive ads, et cetera, that are, that are uh, uh, coming down the pike uh, as early as March, April, uh, May, et cetera. So uh, it's very exciting. And, you know, again, from a, from the CFO perspective, you know, what gives me a lot of comfort is this is success-based spend. Um, you know, it, it, we're going to toggle it up and down uh, uh, with what we see in terms of, uh, you know, the performance of, uh, of the product. And, and again, I could not be more excited about this, you know, being the best user of our free cash flow right now. Okay. Thanks, Gunnar. Thank you. And our next question comes from Rich Greenfield from Lightshed Partners. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking the question. This is sort of a follow-up to a couple of questions that have been asked. You know, when you think about the Discovery Plus product to date, you know, when we look at it, you know, 12 of the top 13 shows have been sort of shows that are on TV or on linear TV, uh, led by Travel Channel's Ghost Adventures. The only one that's been exclusive to Discovery Plus has been actually Fixer Upper from Chip and Joanna. I guess two thoughts come to mind. One, do you think your service is uniquely less exposed or less does it need less original programming than other streaming services because people like watching your catalog content over and over? Two, do you think that Fixer Upper sort of points you in the direction of maybe Chip and Joanna shouldn't be launching a cable network and it should just stay exclusive, their content should stay exclusive to Discovery Plus? And then just the last piece of that, you mentioned pausing the share buyback to invest in Discovery Plus. I guess just given investor excitement over your stock and the huge move you've seen in your stock year to date, why not take advantage of it, actually sell stock, strengthen the balance sheet, and actually invest even more in programming? Or, again, maybe you don't need to spend that much on programming given what I mentioned before. So I just love your views on that whole uh, subject. Sure. Well, let me start with the content. Um, we've never made, made, made our entire library available before. So one is there's a lot of excitement about being able to sit down and watch all Mythbusters, look at all the seasons of Deadliest Catch, you know, Ice Road Truckers, go back and watch a bunch of Lifetime movies all in one sitting. So we're making available this whole bucket of content, all the food, go back, your Guy Fieri, spend an afternoon watching Diners and Dives. So there, there, there's a lot of appeal in, in our full library, too. There's a huge amount of original content that is on there that's doing really well. The metrics are really not the same for us. If you take those 12, top 12 sh uh, shows, that's less than 10% of what's viewed on the platform. So, you know, if it, you know uh, I'm not on the inside of these other SVOD platforms, but when they, when they launch a big movie or they launch a big series, if they, if they name three, it might be 30% of the viewing or 40% of the viewing. For us, it's less than 10%. Uh, so our product is a lot of long tail. When you, and, and a lot of the original content is very helpful, I think, because it makes it, – it, it is clear that it's differentiated. One of the reasons why a lot of people that have Go are, are, are moving over and paying for this product is there's more there and there's a ton of original content. Um, so I think – we think we, we're, we're onto something with the mix. Um, we're not being guided that much by seeing that they're watching this show or that show, because when we actually look at the full numbers, you know, it, the answer is that they, we've represented 50% of what people watch on TV, and that's not available anywhere else. You go to the others for scripted series and scripted movies, and the, the big takeaway for us is people are willing to pay for that other 50% so far, and that could be a, a yellow brick road for us. And uh, Rich, I mean, you know, on the on the share buyback side, remember we have so much free cash flow uh, uh, coming coming in, right? So that uh, generates a lot of firepower to fund our organic acquisitions. On the on the leverage side, I, I, as I said before, I'm I'm feeling very good. It's uh, and not only I'm feeling very good, agencies are supportive as well. And uh, uh, the reality is, we have less than four billion dollars coming due over the next uh, five years after our, you know, uh, uh, prepayment here and uh, that's going on in March right now. So, so I think we're in a very good position. We we are prioritizing the reinvestment into the, our own company right now, but not in the form of buybacks, but in in, in the form of future growth. I think. And what about the, Chip and Joanna? Oh, um, as I said, we've done a very you know, a very innovative alignment together. And you're going to continue to see content on Discovery Plus exclusively. 
Um, you know, there may be a window. Maybe uh, we think linear is still valuable. They've produced a lot of a lot of good content. Um, but you'll be seeing, you know, a tremendous amount of of content coming from them and coming from their creative factory. It'll be on Discovery Plus exclusively or exclusively for a period of time before it shows up somewhere else. I think the, the only other thing I'd add, Rich, to your comment about the franchises is that, you know, I think one of the successes we've found, you mentioned the top shows and, and how many, there's a lot of the top shows on Discovery Plus right now that are uh, talent, existing talent or known talent or known franchise base. So you take a uh, Magnolia's Table or a Bobby and Giada uh, in Italy uh, or even some of the, uh, of the offshoots of the 90 Day franchise. And I think that's one of the things we see as a great success is ultimately being able to super serve and, and give people even more. But that stuff is exclusive to Discovery Plus. And so while it could fit a naturally in a second window or down the line back on a network, because it's very, uh, it's very complementary to the existing franchises, they are exclusive to Discovery Plus. So we do think you know, in order to continue to expand the base also, um, that will be important to have a right balance of certainly some of the library and the depth of the library is incredibly important, but also some of the exclusive content, even if it is based on some IP and franchises that come from the television uh, networks. And, and outside the U.S., um, we're finding that with our local language, local sports strategy, that having a, a particularly compelling piece of local IP that's available exclusively is driving. I mean, speak to that a little bit, JB. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing real growth in Poland when we take, you know, a particular piece of, of compelling local IP and put it just on our, our uh, Discovery Plus product. Yeah, I mean, you know, consistent with uh, what, we, what we did think in our hypothesis and what we outlined is what we thought was sort of part of our secret sauce back in December of this combination of great local IP with the strength of the global library, we are seeing that bear fruit, which is, uh, you know, a lot of the local IP that is, uh, whether it be in Poland, the Nordics, the UK, Italy, uh, is what's driving a significant amount of volume uh, to the service and in terms of the acquisitions. And then coming into the service, uh, finding and discovering all this new and great content that people had never seen. And I think the other thing, this is true about international, it's also true about the US, is the reality is the 55,000 hours is such a large volume of content in, in the genres and passion areas that people love that without a uh, digital algorithmic recommendation engine to surface that stuff to people, it's just never something that could have been perfectly exploited on linear television when you have a 24-7 channel and you are limited by capacity. And so... Uh, and, and, and by the way, that replatforming that we're doing internationally is partly to take advantage of the more sophisticated recommendation we en engine we have on Discovery Plus that currently doesn't exist in Discovery Plus outside the U.S., but will once we finish the replatform. So that surfacing of new content, even if it's out of the library, that feels new to so many viewers, we think is also a big opportunity to satisfy the consumers. Very helpful. Thanks for the details. Thank you. And our next question comes from Alexia Quadrani from JP Morgan. Your line is open. Uh, thank you. Just uh, two quick questions, if I may. Um, the first one is, are you, um, you know, can we expect you guys can even get a higher proportion of advertising budgets given the incremental reach of Disney Plus? It just sounds like it's a very attractive overall, you know, offering you can provide as, as Discovery as a company to advertise. I'm curious if it's an incremental positive there. And then the second question is just really on, on local international production. Um, you know, are you seeing that getting a bit harder or get a bit more expensive now that, you know, Discovery Plus and other, a lot of other streaming services are trying to build up on local content? Uh, thanks, Alexia. On, on the ad budgets, you know, Getting back to our, even before we get to Discovery Plus, with our traditional business, what Steinloff uh, has been and his team have very effectively done, and, and he and I have been on the road with, every, you know, we've, with all the big agencies at least three times over the, since the Scripps deal, is dealing with the fact that the broadcasters are getting, over, are getting over $60 in CPM, and we were getting a third of that. And, but, but we're the number one player for women or the number two player for women. 
And we have the num- we have the number one network with TLC. We have the number one show with 90 Day Fiance. And so we've been pushing that rock uphill. And you see in our numbers how we've been driving that CPM. But now we have a whole basket where we have this win-win of come in with us for $40 plus CPM. You know, why are you going to get a repeat on a broadcast network when you could buy original content on us? And we get a huge premium on our CPM. You know, we believe that this should ultimately flip. That aside from sports, we should be getting a, a premium versus the broadcasters, because we're producing. We have we have length of view. We have we we have an, an audience that's engaged. We have endemics with food and home where advertisers want to be, and so we think we have some real momentum there. And we're and we're going to push on it because we, you know think, we think from an equitable perspective and from a performance perspective. We should see much more of that money with much more CPM with better returns. And we think advertisers are starting to agree with us. And you should see that flowing through over a period of time. And with Go and Discovery Plus, we do have a lot more uh, opportunity because with Discovery Plus bigger than we thought, with Go continuing to perform, we have more capacity. Um, And we're seeing that the attractiveness of that capacity in terms of the kind of premiums that we're getting in CPM um, on Discovery Plus, where there's only a few ads, is really terrific. So uh, it's and, and it's incremental reach, real incremental reach for us, non-cable, um, and so which is quite helpful. Uh, and on on the on on the local, you, you know, leaning in, we do need original content. We have been doing it. JB's been producing a lot of it in every language. We have the factory that converts all of our content into every language. But we are doing more original because it's helping us both on linear and direct to consumer. But JB, talk about how we've kind of pivoted this year to lean in even harder. Yeah, I think I think uh, certainly in, in the core markets with the biggest scale, we'll continue to sort of pivot on and focus on on the right level of local content to drive the acquisitions. I think the other thing that's exciting for us that we've never been able to take advantage of in a material way is we have. Um, now, in, even in the last 90 days, examples of shows that originate out of one market that are top 10 or top five, in some cases, drivers in other international markets. And so when we talk about local content, local content used to only mean monetization in one market. The reality is now we're starting to see more value and benefit being driven out of local content multi-market. So we did an Estonia documentary on the, the terrible and, and tragic uh, capsizing, the largest ferry disaster in the Nordics that was originated out of our Nordics business. It's now a top performer uh, in the UK, a top performer in Italy. And so uh, local content investment doesn't just mean local. It means local with value now to travel, which is something that we never had. So we're excited about that opportunity as well. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take our last question from Michael Morris from Guggenheim. Your line is open. Hey, thanks, guys. Good morning. Um, I'll try to sneak a couple in here if I could. Uh, First, can we talk a little bit about the affiliate uh, pace domestically, and especially the strength you're talking about in the first quarter? The the 5% that you saw in the fourth quarter, that seems to all be coming from the linear business. And I'd appreciate if you could talk about you know, what drove that acceleration? I know we talked about a little bit of, of, of the improvement in subscribers, but really it seems like you uh, would have had to have some kind of pricing, you know, discrete pricing improvement there. Um, so can you just help with that and how much that impacts the, that underlying pace, um, you know, as we go into the new year and, and that growth you're expecting? And then just a couple um, on international digital, if I could. Uh, of the 5 million subscribers, next-gen subscribers you discussed in the fourth quarter, how many of those were D play subs that sort of became Discovery Plus subs um, on the conversion? And then the last thing, can you talk about India and, and your product in that market um, at all, where you are on that, and if that contributed to uh, your, your reported numbers this quarter? Thanks for taking the questions. Okay, Michael, let me, let me start with the, uh, with the distribution guidance. And, and you may have noted that I uh, deliberately said distribution rather than affiliate because I do not want to create the perception that our you know, traditional affiliate number is accelerating uh, by 100% here. So you're 100% right. We were up four, 5% in the fourth quarter, and that was uh, almost completely traditional business driven. It's a combination of pricing, 
uh, uh, slightly better subscriber trends. Uh, we've, we've, we've lost less than in, 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 in prior quarters. Uh, and also we've done very well on the, on the side of the virtual MVPDs. So, so that's, the, that's the Q4 uh, uh, number, mostly linear. For Q1, we're talking about high single digit, uh, potentially double digit. Then a lot of that acceleration is obviously coming from uh, the D2C trends, given the subscriber uh, success that we've seen uh, so far. That is going to start very materially contributing uh, to that number. That's why I started talking about distribution, the way we lay it out in our uh, uh, financial statements as well, rather than you know just affiliate. Um, on uh, on India, um, uh, well, you can say, yeah, yeah. What was from your JV? Yeah. I, I mean, on, on the international, uh, Michael, to your question on the international, uh, the vast majority of those subscribers are Discovery Plus. Um, so it's a, you know, the, and if you add in the Eurosport player, which will convert, it's really, you know, vast, vast majority of, dis, of, of subscribers. So that's number one. Number two on India, uh, look, it's been a nice business. It's grown for us nicely, uh, but it remains, you know, in terms of obviously the logical questions of that being a lower ARPU market. Um, it is a, it remains a, a, a small piece of the overall, you know, kind of single digit level percentage uh, of, of our international portfolio today. So it's a nice, it's grown nicely, but it's, um, it remains a smaller part of the overall international uh, subscriber story. And, and, and JB, just to be clear that the, uh, I'm trying to reconcile the 5 million subs and the, the part that you said the vast majority were Discovery Plus, I guess, are you saying the majority of the five million that you guys discussed in December uh, converted to become Discovery Plus? So more than more than half of those five million. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay, that's great. Um, thank you very much for that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That does conclude the question and answer session for today's conference. Ladies and gentlemen, this now concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation, and you may now disconnect. Everyone. Have a wonderful day.